Uh, wow, I'm overwhelmed by those introductions. Um, and I have two people to thank for them. Um, Sherman James, as he mentioned, is a longtime uh, friend of mine whose work I have long admired and been inspired by. I think his work tells one of the most important American stories there is, and, and interestingly, through the traces of the effects of, of race and racial challenge on blood pressure. Uh, it is a profound story, and so it's a great honor to be introduced by him. Uh, and James uh, Jackson is, we've known each other for over 50 years. <laughs> uh, we had big afros and we were gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm glad there are no photographs to, <laughs> to bear witness to any of that. Uh, but we've been buddies for a long time. Uh, James's own work uh, and the great generosity of his, of his character and his career uh, and our long friendship are just really deep treasures uh, of mine. And so, uh, again, it is truly uh, an honor and deeply gratifying to be introduced by him and to have him written, have him written such a, a wonderful, uh, generous, warm introduction. Uh, I would also like to uh, offer a, a word of tribute to Gordon, to Gordon Allport. Uh, unlike Martha, I actually do admire the name of the, <laughs> of the person to whom I'm being uh, in, in, inducted into this fellowship. <laughs> uh, I think uh, Gordon Allport uh, is among uh, the very few greatest uh, scientists of human prejudice that we have ever had. Uh, he laid out the modern paradigm through which we understand human prejudice and his major book, The Nature of Prejudice, at 63 years past its initial publication, is still, I think, the best, most comprehensive account of human prejudice between two covers. So I greatly honor that work. It's a marvelous uh, contribution. Uh, that book and its cogency are some of the reasons I went into social psychology. So it is uh, the greatest honor to be inducted uh, into this fellowship as the 2017 Gordon Allport Fellow. Uh, I, had, I have noted from hearing a couple of other uh, induction speeches that I was sent that people in these speeches often point to a chief lesson that they've learned through the toils of their work. Uh, so I thought I would take that uh, approach. Uh, and to briefly point out one that has struck me many times uh, throughout my career, but that I've rarely taken the time to be explicit about. You know, we all have these little pet theories and hunches and, uh, about how to do the business. So this is, this is a little bit inside the business, but it's been, it's been a, strong a strong and growing conviction of mine over the years. Uh, and that's the importance of perspective taken in one's research and theorizing. In particular, the difference in perspective between the scientist observing a phenomenon or problem and the people living the phenomenon or enduring the problem. Whether one takes an actor's or an observer's perspective toward a phenomenon can make a huge difference in how we understand and explain the phenomenon and, how, and the policy that follows from it. So I want to start with a really brutally simple example. Let's take the example of, of explaining why a person is late to an important department meeting. Uh, <laughs> uh, as an observer of this behavior, it is the person arriving late that is most prominent in one's purview on the situation. Uh, thus, in explaining the lateness, one might easily point to things about the person, him or herself, bad time management habits, disorganization, disinterest in department affairs, and so on. But if the late person is oneself, uh, giving one the perspective <laughs> of the actor living through the lateness, one has a different purview on the situation. What's prominent or available in, the purview, in, in this purview is not the person himself or herself, but the circumstances and conditions that the person is contending with. A nanny who arrived late, lost keys, a traffic jam. These are what's salient, what's prominent. In this way, the observer and actor's perspective can lead to very different understandings and explanations of the same phenomenon. The observer's perspective can be said to have dominated our 20th century understanding of how negative stereotypes and stigma affect their targets. As observers of stigmatized groups, it is the group themselves that are most prominent in our purview of the situation, that are the most cognitively available to us. Thus, it is easy to see the primary effect of stigma and stereotyping as, 
an effect on the stereotype themselves. For example, causing a, quote, psychic damage that goes on to cause, in some part, the poor economic, educational, health outcomes often experienced by these groups. Seems reasonable enough. And it is the view expressed by no less than W.E.B. Du Bois, Sigmund Freud, and I dare say Gordon Allport, in relation to such groups as blacks, Jews, and women. And of course, it still dominates our lay psychology of how, people affect, how stereotypes affect us. The actor's perspective is different. The actor, the person being stereotyped or stigmatized, is not looking at himself. He's facing the conditions of his life. That's what's foremost, what's available in his purview. Thus, he might well see stereotyping and stigma as having their effect in a very different way, not by changing or damaging something about himself, such as his self-esteem or confidence, but by affecting things he has to contend with in his life, things like the possibility of being judged or treated stereotypically in important situations. Rather than the stigma or stereotype becoming an internalized and possibly damaging part of his character or psyche, it might affect him most often by simply being a pressure he has to contend with in important situations where the stereotype applies. If this is true, then removing that pressure in such situations might lead him to behave just like everybody else in those situations. He'd need no therapy to fix a damaged psyche. He'd need only a few signals from the situation that he won't be stereotyped there. This is essentially what stereotype res threat research has shown over the last 20 years or so. I'm proud of that and of the different view of the stereotyped and stigmatized that this research has helped bring to light. But in the search for lessons from research, among the most important is the lesson about perspective and the implication it has for the policies and remediations we recommend. This distinction between the observer's and the actor's perspective may be methodology 101 in some fields, but in too much social science, certainly some of my own, the observer's perspective dominates. It is so much easier to access with nary a second thought. The actor's perspective is, of course, harder to get to, the business of situating, some, situating oneself in someone else's shoes and staying there for a while. And often our methodologies and measures and our methodological fundamentalisms get in the way, uh, implicitly channeling us toward an observer's perspective and then stranding us there. But I'd say, in relation to almost any of the problems we care about, poverty, poor health and education outcomes, inequality, incarceration, etc., trying to take the, pers the perspective of the people living through these problems, seeing what they see, can lead to fresh insights that better inform theory, interventions, and, and policy. Perspective matters. And I want to thank you very much for this honor. Thank you. <laughs>